gather around the table. In the last few weeks, uh, we have gathered around the table as a faith family and began to learn lessons about from our spiritual mentor, the Apostle Paul. In the first week, we learned about how things in life can, can get complicated. And we need to, to have a plan and provide steps to, to keep things simple in our life. And last week, we looked at what can we do when we gather around the table with our friends and, and loved ones, and there's tension. Because we know that, that, that someone is always going to say something or, or bring up a conversation, that there's going to be tension around the table. And we've been looking at uh, the letter that Paul had written to the church in Galatia. And the pressing issue around that evolved around this letter in Paul right, Paul's writing was this thing about grace. And you see, Paul his entire life has, has, has preached the gospel and, and taught that grace of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the grace found in Jesus Christ alone was all that was needed for salvation. There was this other group of, of people that had this false idea, if you will, that had kind of manipulated their way into the leadership of the church. And they, they said that this grace idea that Paul was teaching, the grace of Jesus, was okay. I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll tolerate it. But it was the grace plus something. And I've been calling it the plus one. It was grace plus circumcision. It was grace plus giving to the church. It was grace plus rules. Grace plus the law. Grace plus something. And Paul was saying, no, 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 no. It is the grace and grace alone that provides for us, through Jesus Christ, salvation. And in chapters 1 and 2 that we went through the first two weeks, Paul had been pretty nice. Um, and then today in chapter 3, Paul totally changes his tone. Um, if you read the original Greek, Paul really gets serious. He gets more assertive, if you will. And it's like my father, when we would gather around the table and a, and a subject would come up, and, and my father would, would, would begin to talk, and we would listen, but then he would say, now listen here, son. Listen here, son. And that was our cue to really pay attention to what he was saying. And we knew if he said the same thing twice, we really, really had to pay attention to what he was saying. We knew to pay attention, and Paul is doing this because the debate had moved from Jesus plus circumcision to Jesus plus the law, or, or, or more specifically, Jesus plus these set of, set of rules. And these, these religious leaders were saying, you know, again, we're fighting with the grace of Jesus, but it's really Jesus plus these rules. It's really Jesus plus all these traditions that we follow. It's really Jesus plus this, this hierarchy of administration that you have to keep in the church. He says it's really Jesus plus um, doing things kind of the old way. It's Jesus plus Robert's Rules of War. And they're literally saying that, that we'll tolerate your, your grace thing, Paul, a little bit. But we want to make sure everyone, Jews and Greeks alone, follows this old way that we did church. We need to follow this legalistic, unrealistic way of doing things. So in chapter 3, Paul begins to address this notion that it's Jesus plus these long set of rules, laws of what to do and what not to do, or the old way of doing things. So if you will, in, in chapter uh, 3 of, of Galatians, if you will, we'll begin it, we're going to begin in the 21st verse. Paul writes, The law... Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would be certain, would certainly have come by the law. Basically, he is saying that if God could have passed one law or a set of laws and created a list of behaviors, and as long as we follow or obey or live by these rules, everyone would be right in the eyes of God. Everyone would be good in God's standing. Paul says if God could have done that, he would have done that. But he couldn't. Because we are born into sin. We would never follow a law. And so that's why he had to send his son, Jesus Christ. Because the laws weren't working. Verse 22. The scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, may be given to those who believe. Paul says, 
says it's, it's not about laws. It's not about obeying this legalistic way of living but, but this, or this unrealistic legalistic standard. He says it's about this grace of Jesus that, that unlocks us from this prison of sin. When I read the words, the scripture, one thing that, that jumps out at me all the time is, is when I was preparing for this is the words locked up. We feel captured. We feel locked up. We feel in the weight of living in this world. And I can, I can remember that vaguely. I remember Hope and Abby just, just minutes after she was born. And I can, I can remember holding her in my arms and totally, totally, totally on the inside freaking out. I mean, here I was, I was, I was a young newlywed, I was a, I was a failed musician, I worked in a treatment facility, and I worked with, with adolescent sex offenders, a group of kids no one, no one wanted to work with. And I didn't know anything really about, about being a father, and I remember some of the things my father taught me around the table about how being a dad, and this little person that I would hope was holding would rely on me to keep her safe. Rely on me to provide her love, to love her unconditionally and teach her about life. And by the grace of Jesus and grace alone, she survived. And you think it would have gotten easier. I mean, you think, you know, in four years into it, into this father thing, then Will was born. And you would think I would be a little bit better, but here I'm holding him, minutes after he was born, totally freaking out once again. Because this little dude that I was holding now would rely on me for the same things Abby would. I didn't kill her yet, so I knew I got the diaper changing and feet and all that stuff now. But this, this, this was a boy. And, and I remember freaking out because I know I will be the greatest role model that he will ever have in his life. I must be an example of how to navigate life through, through testosterone and, and how to treat women and how to be a good husband. You name it, I was the greatest influence and role model that this son had. And, and through it all, these two kids would be watching me. And everything I am, everything I say, everything I do, everything I don't do will impact their life and their trajectory for life forever. Their future will be dictated by the way I act. And you know what? No one gave me a rule book. No one gave me a set of rules of saying, this is what you have to do. This is what you know. And I, and I see as I look across our culture and our community, you know, I, I, I see that there are times that this legalistic, unrealistic standard is bombarding us, not only in parenting, but, but in every way. And many of us are living as prisoners or, or locked up, if you will, under this legalistic way of living out our faith. It's a way that Jesus did not want us to live. But I believe that, that as I read this, there are four things or four prisons or four things, if you will, that Paul is telling us that, that will keep us locked up, if you will. And yet they're in your, in your sermon notes and you can follow along on on the screen. But the first one is the, the prison of comparison. <laughs> this is a, a prison that keeps many of us captive, if you will. And this comparison thing is, is so natural. I mean, we compare our lives to other people. We compare our faith family to other churches. We compare today with yesterday or a year ago. And this comparison thing is a prison. It keeps us locked up from living when we are constantly comparing our life with someone else's life. Or we're comparing our situation to someone else. Or this season of life with another time in life. With this relationship, with another relationship. And when we would gather around the table, my father would say, and I can remember it clearly, I don't care what your, your friend's parents let them do. I'm not your friend's parent. I'm your father. I'm your responsibility. And the, the trick is that we always tend to compare ourselves to others when we are at our lowest point and they are at our highest point. We always tend to, to, to compare ourselves 
when, when, when something is at its best, with our situation, when it's at its lowest. And this prison, because it keeps us locked up, and before you know it, we're locked up with this guilt, with this doubt, with this shame, with this blame, and this contentment. And it begins to creep in. And it's a prison of an unrealistic standard that we do not have to live up to. Does it mean we don't try our best? Oh, no, we still try our best. And to unlock the prison of comparison, it's simple on paper, but difficult to do if you would like to fill in the blame. To unlock the prison of comparison, we must refuse to compare. I mean, we have to understand that, that we have a unique journey. The two gifts of God for, for me and Kelly are, 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 are unlike no other. doesn't mean they're better or worse. They're just unique. We have a unique journey. Our, our family is, is odd. And it, 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 it is, has a unique way, unlike anyone else's, that God uses us. Not only as individuals, but, but as a family unit. And that God will continue to use us to do things in the future. It doesn't mean we're better. We're just weird or unique. And we're all like that. Because no gift of God is the same. So be the best you you can be. Remember, my dad told me that all the time. Just be the best Tommy you can be. You don't have to be a Robert or Jane or, or any other of my siblings. The first one is the prison to compare. The second prison, and this is a hard one, is the prison of distraction. We live in a world that gives us the technology and the ability to never, ever be connected. Growing up, my father worked in this huge chemical plant. And when my father went to work, you could not get in touch with him. You could not call him on the phone. You could not go to the, the, the guard shack or the guard gate, and they would not let you in. And that is unthinkable today. That when my father would go to work, he would be unreachable. And, and we've got these things that are called smartphones. And the greatest thing about a smartphone or a cell phone is that they're smart. <laughs> Are they not? I mean, they give you alerts, updates, st status updates, tweets. They're always asking me to, to uh, push my notification. If anyone knows what that means, please let me know. Because I don't know. I always put yes. You want me to push your notification? Yeah, sure. And the, but the problem with smartphones is that it doesn't know when we don't need to be distracted by it. I noticed, noticed it recently. A few months ago, we, we all had smartphones except Kelly. She's kind of slow on the technological age, but she always keeps hers in her purse anyway. And we would be eating around the table. And we'd be talking, but then there would be kind of a, a low in the excitement and the, and the jokes. And I'd get a beat, and I'd check my phone. And then, and then my ADD would kick in, and it would tell me that the Tigers were winning the basketball game, and I'd have to click to see who's scoring the highest. And then I'd have to click, oh, there's an email. And then Abby would do the same, and then, and then once I got on mine, then Bill would get on his, and he was tweeting and taking pictures of what we were reading. And Kelly would say, sort of under her breath, I wish I had a smartphone. So I got her one. And then recently, I, I have been conscious of, of not getting my phone out when, when I'm with people or leaving it in my car when I, when I go to visit or, or, or shutting it off at times, especially while we're around the table and eating. And one meal, I, I looked around, and, 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 and before I know it, it, it wasn't like, bam, up, upside the head, the, the message was, but it slowly evolved. And did, I, did I look around, and, and, and everyone was on their cell phone. And I realized what I had been doing to, to them. I realized how they felt. I realized how inconsiderate I'd been. They didn't mean anything hurtful. But it's hurtful to be.
be surrounded by the people you love. And I wanted to scream what Kelly had been saying all along. Be with me. Just be with me. Then I realized that when I had this, I was there, but I wasn't there. You know, you know what I'm saying? I mean, we live in a world where it gives us the ability to live where we are never all there. Are smartphones good? Yes, they are. I mean, but we need to be cautious because it allows us to not be all there. When we're at work, we're checking and updates and status and worrying about what's happening at home. And when we're at home, we're checking on what's going on at work. When we're in either, either of them, we're getting updates and alerts about what's happening in the, in the outside world. Some of us can remember a time, get this, some of us can remember a time where the hardest thing was to get, get communication out of someone. Now it's hard to keep people from being distracted by communication. And the key to unlock this prison of distractment, or distraction is easy. Be present. Be present. My basketball scores are winning. So put it down. Turn it off. Maybe you need to turn off the TV or something and get down on the floor and wrestle. I don't know. And I don't know what that looks like for you in your, in your daily life. But give the ones you love 100% of you. That's what we do. First is the prison of comparison. The second is the prison of distraction. And the third is another hard one. Is the prison of more. A legalistic, unre unrealistic law. A legalistic, unrealistic law that has been placed upon us is that we have to give our children more materialistic possessions than we had growing up. And this hits hard for home because, because I had to learn that. You see, it was, it was kind of ingrained in me that, that you're only successful as a parent if you could provide more stuff to the next generation. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that, that nothing could be further from the truth. You see, my childhood memories are not about the things my, my parents gave me. The memories that, that the people will carry with them when you are gone will not be about stuff. Because what you have is the only reality that you know. You see, my dad would say growing up around the table, you know what? And he would share, share stories about his childhood. He goes, you know, I, I guess looking back now, I guess we were dirt poor. But you know, we never really realized that at the time. You see, it was, it was all you have is all you have. And what people will remember are the experiences and the stories. Our success is not about more, but about experiences and stories. <clears throat> Team FCC Honduras is exactly about that. Exactly. And the people that, that traveled and the people that, that, that helped raise money and surrounded the, the group with, with love and care and support and prayers and, and, and listened to the stories and the, and the pictures when they come back. You see, they will always, always remember and tell the story of what God had each of us experience. How God have, have, how God navigated us coming off one huge experience with Centralia Group Work Camp and touching our own community and 90 days after that turn around and go to another country to share God and connect people to God's love. You see, that's what people remember. Those that, that traveled and got on the plane will not remember how much money it cost. Now some people around here will, but those that won't will not. And what some of us as parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and heirs, aunts and uncles and friends and leaders in the faith community, what we need to do is we need to do what we need to provide for our children is more stories.
Because it is possible that our children, our young people, and others are wandering through this faith thing because they are looking for a better story and a better experience. And see, we have the ability to, to take control over the story and experiences we get to live. We all have the ability to craft experiences, to, to seize the moment, and to, to engage others in the story that they will remember forever. That goes way beyond the material stuff or the checkbook. That's what it's about. It's about creating stories and memories. Not stuff. And so to unlock this prison of war is to create experiences and, and, and stories. People remember how you made them feel. People remember the, the trips you took. People re will remember the, the hikes that you went on. People will remember that, that you came up on the church and, and, and made Valentine's Day cookies and, and delivered it to those in our, in our faith community. Those things will last forever. Stuff won't. So to unlock the prison of war, we must create experiences and stories. And last but not least, the fourth prison we must unlock. Again, these are simple to do, or simple in theory, but hard to do. It's the prison of insecurity, of, of low self-esteem. Kind of like to, to, to coin it. The I'm not good enough prison. <laughs> and I've not spoken to anyone from, as I said, from five years old to 150, who if they were honest, have not had a moment in their life or a season in their life where they did not think that they were not good enough. I get that. I get that because for years in our marriage, I never once thought that I was good enough for the love of Kelly. I never truly thought that I deserved a, a blessing of, of being a father. You see, because when I when I looked at my life from that point backwards, I mean I had more, I had way more failures. I had way more secrets. I had way more demons that I had to overcome. And, and, and I knew all that, but, but Kelly, Kelly didn't. I shared that with her, but she didn't know what I was like before. And I truly, truly, truly thought that I never deserved the blessing of being a father. And maybe, maybe that's you. And, and maybe that's the way you feel. And if, if that's you, I want you to hear something from the faith side, not of a, of a legalistic or an unrealistic standard of living that someone else said. I want to say something loud and clear to everyone. And something that I had learned around the, the, my father's table, my father in heaven's table, and my father here on earth's table. And I need everyone to stay with me. And we're almost done. But I need you to hear me. Bible says that all children are an inheritance from the Lord. All children, whether that's you in your 105 or a five-year-old, all children are an inheritance from the Lord. The Holy Scripture states that all children are a blessing and a trust from God. Here's what that means. That means it doesn't matter if the child was not planned. It doesn't matter if the child was not predicted. It doesn't matter if you did not want the child or not. If the parents could take care of them or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they were born into a financial secure home or not. And even if you disagree with the circumstances surrounding that child coming into this world, was anything less than positive, Apparently, the God of the universe saw fit to think that you were good enough. And it doesn't matter a hill of beans if you are the biological parent or not. God entrusted you with that child. It doesn't matter if you are the child that's 105. 
That God entrusted you that you are an inheritance for the God who created the universe. He created you with that same love. So the key to unlock this prison of insecurity is to know that you are good enough because of the grace of Jesus Christ. Not because somebody has set this unrealistic, legalistic set of rules. What you should do, what you should do. Verse 23. For the coming of the faith, we are held in custody under the law locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So that the law with our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you all are children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ. So we need to be the best we can be for ourselves and for the next generation. Will we mess up? Yeah. We'll mess up. accept you anyway. Because my blood flowed that day on Calvary to show how much I love you, grace is enough. Grace is enough. So go live with grace. Will you pray with me? Gracious and wonderful God, we realize that there's so many prisons that some of us fall into. There's so many things that, that when we look at the world, the world gives us this unrealistic, legalistic standard that, that people try to judge us by. And we understand, dear God, you are the God that created us, that loved us, that entrusted us into this world. That by your hands we are made and by the blood of Jesus Christ we are saved. And by that grace and grace alone, we're able to, to look past the prisons and unlock ourselves to live freely. We understand, dear God, that you didn't intend for us to, to live under the weight of, 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 a, of a society that puts legalistic and unrealistic demands upon us. So help us to be the best we can be. Help us to not compare to others. Help us to, to not be distracted by other things in this world. Help us to, to not be obsessed with, with providing more stuff, but providing more stories and experiences that we can share together. Help us to see that, that we are your gift. That we are good enough. We understand, your God, that, that we hear these things and they're easy. We feel that they're easy to do when we hear them, but we know in our everyday life they're hard to do. So give us through the power of the Holy Spirit the strength to unlock these prisons that we may live as you chose us to live, under the grace of our Lord and Savior.